Good afternoon. My name is Chris Bain and I am the NEC member for the West Midlands. And I want to, want to welcome all of you to the second of our policy debates at this year's conference. Um, the debate is on um, connecting communities from buses to broadband, looking at how we can improve the ways we keep in touch with each other, how we travel, how we access services and how we communicate. I'd like to say this was because we had tremendous foresight about the pandemic that was to come, um, but it wasn't. And it, but it turns out that the topic we've chosen is now probably the most critical one that we face in 2020. So here we are now having a virtual debate in an online conference. I don't think we could have imagined that even a year ago. So we've been having this debate up and down the country virtually to discuss this consultation and the responses to the consultation have been read and discussed by the policy subcommittee. You'll find policy papers in the resources section of the website. The debate after our panel will be an opportunity to comment on those policy papers. We do have a panel of expert speakers um, to tee up the debate, um, but before I turn to those, I wonder if uh, uh, my colleague um, and my partner in crime, Mary Wimbury, would like just to say a few words uh, to, the, to the panel session. Thanks very much for that, Chris. Um, I'm Mary Wimbury, and I'm delighted to have been elected from, by members in Labour and Cooperative Wales to uh, as their representative on the NEC. We're obviously, we've got a lot of new members on the NEC, um, and indeed on the policy committee. So Chris, as a continuing member, is chairing this session. But I just wanted to say on behalf of the new policy committee that after this conference, we'll obviously be thinking about our programme for the next year. And we'd really appreciate your input um, as we start to discuss how we manage the policy process. Um, so I think we've got a lot of new and excited uh, members and we're really looking forward to engaging with that and engaging with you on it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mary, for that. And we'll be hearing more from Mary um, a little bit later on. So what I want to do now is to turn to our panel of expert speakers to tee up this debate. And I will then throw open um, the discussion to any members who wish to take part. To do this, they're saying you need to come behind the scenes here with us and let us know in the Q&A box on the right of the live video if you're watching on our website what you want to have you say. Okay, to introduce then our panel of speakers, the first one I've got here on my list is Steve Reed MP. Uh, Steve is the Labour and Cooperative MP for Croydon North and serves on Labour's front bench as Shadow Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government. So he does have some insight, I think. He was leader of Lambeth Council from 2006 to 2012, during which time he led the Cooperative Council Commission and has since become the honorary president of the Co-op Council's Innovation Network. Steve is also my colleague on the Policy Commission on Housing, Transport and Local Government. Can I hand over to you now, Steve, for your input? Thank you very much, Chris, and it's good to see you, uh, albeit through a screen, uh, and everyone else who's on here as well. And thank you for the invitation to participate in this session. I was really excited to hear Liam speaking just then. I think that vision he's got um, shaping up for the West Midlands, that he's really co-producing with local people and local communities. It's just so exciting. And you know we're all gonna be out there uh, as much as we can campaigning uh, for you, Liam, from, you know, I'm going to be doing it from down here in South London as well. We can campaign digitally and by phone, but I'd just love to see you get the chance to um, implement that really exciting and deeply cooperative agenda that you're, that, that you're talking about now. Uh, and I think one of the things Liam pointed to, this sense of community, um, is, is one of the strongest things that is positive that has come out of the whole experience of the pandemic it's just reminded people how much we rely on each other the importance of neighborliness the importance of looking out for each other and dare I say the importance of cooperation uh, in the common good where we all come together to support each other because we do better that way and how powerful were the mutual aid groups uh, in showing us that and um, for many people as well I mean, of course an awful lot of people had a terrible experience both health-wise or because 
they lost their income or their jobs, but there were many people who were able to continue working from home whose experience of working was completely transformed. Things like this, Zoom, uh, other means of digitally communicating with people meant we don't have to be uh, commuting as often to workplaces as we used to. And that's made some people think about where they live, rethink their, their lives and their quality of life. Many people living in more densely uh, densely populated areas, looking at whether they could move to other areas where they can get uh, more more space to live in, a bit of outside space as well, where housing is is perhaps more affordable. But that 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 then brings us to confront another major problem we've got in our community and this in, in our society. And this directly links to um, you know the issues around connect, connected communities, which is so many parts of our country have been held back by a lack of investment a lack of investment in public transport infrastructure uh, so that we don't have high quality, affordable public transport to get people around the country where they need to be able to do that. Broadband, investment in broadband is relatively low quality in much of the country now compared to many of our global uh, competitors. I think there are other breaks on bringing investment where it's needed, like the lack of uh, very high quality, flexible skills training available to people so that they can develop the skills either to get work or, or, to, or to change the kind of work that they're doing while still remaining in their own locality. Far too often, we see many communities that have been held back by that lack of investment, experiencing a brain drain where their younger, more academic, academically talented young people go off uh, perhaps to university, but they never come back because the opportunities aren't there. And then those areas also, relative to perhaps the urban areas that are that are seeing the benefit of, of that talent moving in, are are held back from achieving the potential they could they could do. So some really big issues that we need to confront that are holding communities back and um, preventing them being connected. Now Tories will never correct this. There, there's a lot of talk from them about leveling up but it's an absolute sham uh it, it's 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 all words and no action we've just seen this morning I'm, I'm i'm sure all of you were focused on the conference rather than on the political programs this sunday morning but robert jenrick touring the studios trying to excuse himself for how in in the distribution of the multi-billion pound towns fund um he and his fellow ministers in government denied funding to some of our most deprived towns and high streets in the country and instead appear to have funneled it towards el to supporting election campaigns for conservative candidates uh, in marginal constituencies. So they're, they're doing the, the polar opposite of levelling up. They're misusing public funds is what it looks like to me and we hope to hold Generic to account for that in the Commons. So what do we need to do to try and correct some of these imbalances that are holding communities back. Well, for me, this country uh, is riven by a very, very deep inequality of power. Too much power is hoarded and controlled in Westminster and Whitehall, and decisions are taken at the centre about the regions, the cities, the, the towns and the other places in our country by people who have absolutely no experience of what life is really like in those places and what priorities really need to be uh, addressed through funding uh, and investment in order, to, in order to correct them. So we need a thoroughgoing model of genuine devolution with resources that follow, uh, follow the responsibilities and powers uh, as they come out of, of Whitehall. But beyond that, real models of localization, so local communities don't have to battle their town hall for a voice and the power to assert it, but the town hall will open up power to those communities and direct empowerment of citizens, whether that is as workers in the workplace, public service, user, public service users over the services that they rely on, or residents living in their own neighborhood or community. In all of these cases, we need to look at how we rewire decision-making so that people can participate. And in some cases, as, as Liam was implying in his contribution as well. That means making sure there are community owned institutions that allow people to come together and assert voice over whatever it is that matters uh, that matters the most to them. Now we'll do that. I think we can do that not by burdening people with uh, by forcing them to run services, including uh, locally owned uh, uh, public services. They don't have to run them. That, that would be an imposition on people, but they should be directly responsive and accountable to people 
through mechanisms that will allow that to take place on terms that make sense to the people we're seeking to help. And co-production is the, is the approach. It's not a specific model, it's an approach that means that the decision makers must engage with those affected by the decision uh, in a model where power is equalized between the two and there's a recognition that both sides of that debate have something of importance and value uh, to bring in. Now, community owned and run transport will be a big part of that. If we look at what's gone wrong with our uh, railways over many, many uh, decades, they failed whether they were in the pub public sector or the private sector. I'm old enough to remember British Rail and it was it was a standing joke for the, the, the quality of the, the low quality of the services, the late running of trains, the unreliability of the service. And but now we see exactly the same with the privatized franchise model uh, that was brought in late later on where the whole network is uh, split up trains divorced from the people that run the tracks and we, we've just had chaos and we're all paying through the noses. Uh, for, through the nose for a system that no longer works. Now, for me, the thing that's gone wrong with this is that whether it was in the private sector or the pro public sector, the voice of the passenger was never paramount. And surely the, the, the purpose of public transport is that it should run in the interest of the people who are using it. So I think the cooperative party's long-standing campaign to mutualize the railways offers us a really interesting way forward. Public ownership, but not in the way that we've always conceived it, because it's not public ownership that puts power in the hands of civil servants in Whitehall. It's a model of public ownership that puts power in the hands of the people who use public transport, and it can be regionalized as well, so that we try and get decision-making as close as possible to the people who will be relying on it. Now, there are many other schemes we could look at uh, as well. Community, community owned shared, shared vehicle schemes. Uh, many, some areas are piloting those and I think they offer us a, a, a lot that's very interesting in, very interesting I think we should look at more self-directed funds for learning and reskilling so instead of people having to go and see what's available and they have to simply be allocated to what's available even if it's not quite right for them people should be allowed to have control of their own budget for um, learning through throughout life or reskilling if they need to get themselves ready for new forms of employment people should be able to control their own budget for that, perhaps increasing their power over what's available by combining together in collaboratives or cooperatives uh, that allow them more control over the, um, over the provider side of what's available for their, for their reskilling. And my final point is, I think part of the, uh, the way that we connect communities and, and open up power to communities to achieve these outcomes is we can look at a, a different model for local government in our communities as well. I'm, I'm very taken by the model of platform cooperatives. And I wonder whether in that there aren't some lessons for how we can rethink local government and give it a different role as a platform for community owned and community led institutions and services tailored and adapted and flexibly responding to the needs of communities up and down uh, the country. Our local authorities have an awful lot of back service, uh, back office services that community led services would benefit from uh, if they could tap into them. That's things like finance, IT, legal and re regulatory services, human resources, many smaller enterprises, social enterprises, community led enterprises find it very expensive to access those if they were available um, through a local authority at, at, at a rate that that the organizations could, could work with, we could see a flourishing of these, these kinds of community owned and community led services, including those that will help connect communities like broadband and uh, public transport. So uh, to finish off, I don't think we, can, we will see truly connected communities until we reconnect those communities to power so that they are able to act in their own interests and bring about the changes that they know best will benefit their places. Brilliant stuff. Thank you, Steve. That was uh, that was some. There were some really interesting concepts there about cooperation. Its time has come, and it now fits the situation we're currently in. And and inequalities driving the pandemic and driving the poverty pandemic. I think there's some really good stuff and devolving beyond local government. I think you and I have talked about that before, and I think that's a great idea. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, can I move on now to Monica Lee? Uh, Monica is a founding member of Broadband for the Rural North and is one of its first directors as well as being on the management team 
and serving as the company secretary. Um, Broadband for the Rural North <coughs> is a professionally designed fiber optic network registered as a community benefit society and run by a local team with the support of volunteers. It's non-profit and part funded by community shares. They provide affordable high-speed connections to rural communities, as well as offering free connections to places of worship, small village schools and village halls. For many years, Monica was a visiting professor at Newcastle Business School and is passionate about the way that cooperatives can change people's lives for the better. I can't wait to hear from you, Monica. <laughs> Okay, hello and thank you very much. Um, this is the first time I've talked in this sort of forum, so I hope that uh, I'm going to follow the uh, rules properly. Um, yes, the community is entirely what has driven us and I think it's the instinct, as I was talked about earlier, the instinct to work together when in adversity. Um, the adversity we faced in 2010 and slightly earlier was because we're in a in the hills behind Lancaster it's an impoverished rural area enormous area with no broadband available at all or half a megabit if that um, and of course so much this even in 2010 was starting to move towards broadband and the um, incumbent suppliers were saying that they just, and quite rightly, that it was not commercial, commercially viable for them to provide for broadband or any of this area. And effectively, though the government at the time said there was 100% coverage, that sort of slipped a bit and it was the 5%, the last 5% just got forgotten in that 100% because it didn't count. Um, so we, a group of us got together thought that we had to do something. Um, we actually tried for uh, local council support and failed to get it. We tried for government support, failed to get it, and grant support. Um, and in the end, we had to uh, go to the community, build up um, a community benefit society, and we started digging. And it is, ha has been amazing the way in which people have pulled together exactly what's being talked about here. Um, the adversity caused us to pull together and it has been very, very timely in this time of COVID. Um, having people being able to talk to each other, um, being able to do things online and not have to go in, have to meet. And also, of course, so many of the areas around us are completely isolated that uh, <laughs> it's quite hard to go in and do things when, when it's such a long distance. Um, uh, I'll talk briefly, if that's all right, about what we do and the benefits of it, just to indicate quite how um, the community has pulled together. Um, we're providing a fiber optic broadband network. We have it, fiber optic is future proof. It doesn't, you don't have line telephone lines going anywhere, anything like that. It's under the ground. It's a brilliant way of working. Um, people ask, well, why, why do people in the rural, rural communities have it and not elsewhere? Uh, and because it is the only real way in a rural community to manage this. Um, you can have poles, but you know they're, they're subject to weather, they're subject to all sorts of things. Um, we've now put in um, 5 million metres of ducting, which shows you quite how large we've grown. We started off just trying to address 12 parishes, and that has now, we have over 100 parishes um, trying to put it in. It's, we, we did have, I mean, we started off with some, obviously, world-beating expertise in network building. Um, which was really good because it was just local expertise within the community. Um, and we've relied, because we've relied on volunteers, most of the volunteers have uh, either been yo very young or elderly who've now retired, who've got superb 
background experience and pulling all that together has worked brilliantly. Um, why we are more successful, well, no, not, not more successful. Why we benefit more than the commercial systems do is because people are contributing both their time, their labor, and also the, um, the way leaves. So we're going across people's ground. We don't have to pay because people buy into this. It's either they're providing shares, they're providing um, digging and so on. And so with, in donating the way leaves too, we don't have to pay that. Um, and also we don't have to make a profit for shareholders. Any money that we will eventually make will go back into the community and it's part of how we're structured. And that has also helped people buy into us, of course. We are now changing and we have to change because we now have paid staff. We're becoming a proper, quite large employer in the area, um, employing local people. We're um, becoming a, a, a real, as it were, <laughs> tech company and have brought housing benefits. We've brought all sorts of benefits into the area because people can now use um, gigabit communications up and down. And for that, we're not, we're, we're not doing the staggered commercial thing of you know, charging a bit more and a bit more, the more speed you get. We're just saying flat rate of 30 pounds a month. Well, it's 20 pounds, 25 and plus fat. And that people benefit from that. It's just straightforward. Um, we've got a lot of goodwill, I suppose I should say. Um, there are, challenges coming up because as we're changing we're having to change the nature of what we do um, we're having to become a lot more commercial um, we don't feel we have a lot of competition at present because none of the commercial people want to deal in such distant areas but in doing this people from across even in one each village has different sort of types of people in it you know farmers academics who always used to not always is wrong but there wasn't that level of mixing that you have sometimes in a, a similar community but having all to work together to put broadband in has brought all sorts of people from different areas in society together so that it, it, it in itself has helped communities coming together just the just the working together to provide it and in doing so, those groups that have got together to, to put the fibre into the ground, when we had floods, it was the barn group that went and tried to help people. Now COVID is on, you know, the barn group has stayed together within each community. Um, and, and that in its own right, just because there's been a goal that they've been working towards, brought people together and has helped that feeling too. Um, in terms of what, I mean, we're helped a lot now by the voucher scheme, which the government has put into place. And so now there is funding for it. We aren't just relying on shareholdings. Um, and that has been of great benefit because it is helping communities. It isn't yet geared up to the really small areas. So it still requires a group of houses, whereas there are people at the end of a line who are still having to, um, we're still having to deal with, which makes it quite hard because it's a, lo a long dig sometimes. Um, but the other thing I think is we're also quite keen to help other groups to put their own broadband um, communities into place. And that, it would be really great if we could have some funding for that because it takes time it takes energy and that has to go to one side when we're focusing on doing something else so in, in terms of what it would be helpful i think would be those as well um i'll leave it to that because if there are questions that would be great <laughs> uh, just, just to reinforce the whole how brilliant the whole cooperative focus has been on this and how the working together is actually fed back into the loop and enhanced it. Thank you. Thank you, Monica.
Now, it's brilliant to hear local initiatives taking off and, and dealing with really important issues in, in an age when I think digital exclusion is really a serious matter for people. I think, that's, I think that's absolutely brilliant. I've, I've been asked to remind people that if you want to ask questions of our panelists, there is a Q&A section on our website where you can ask those questions and we will put those questions to our panelists. So thank you for that, uh, Monica. And our final speaker is uh, Councillor Laura Price. Uh, Laura is a Labour and Co-op councillor in Oxfordshire and has been heavily involved in setting up a people's bus company following cuts to rural services in 2016. Her professional background is as an academic publisher, is in academic publishing, where she works as a commissioning editor. Uh, over to you, Laura. Thank you. Um, I, I haven't actually been in publishing for a long time now. I think that the Labour Party and the Co-op Party swallowed up my life. So, you know, it's... <laughs> <laughs> things have moved on and buses obviously um but but thank you chris and thanks for the introduction and it was really interesting to hear steve pulling all those threads together and to hear about monica's experiences and one of the things that monica said that really um that really chimed with me was the idea of bringing really diverse different people together under that project of creating something for their community, because that was definitely my experience in, in setting up West Oxfordshire Community Transport as well. Um, so I'm one of three founder directors of West Oxfordshire Community Transport, and I'm also the chair. Um, and I've held that role since we formed in 2016. Um, so we're a registered community benefit society. And at the moment we have um, just over 160 members. Um, who hold shares in our organisation that we can use um, as, as part of, of delivering our services that we're committed to. So we currently run four bus routes in West Oxfordshire, but we are committed to exploring the options for delivering more. And so um, that's something that we're always looking at on an ongoing basis and communicating with communities and members about. Um, our bus services so community transport is quite a varied field. So um, the model that we operate on is actually timetabled bus services. So anyone can get on a bus just, just as, a, as a kind of hail and ride. Um, and we operate those services in normal times, six days a week. Um, although we have been operating um, temporary timetables since we did restart services in July following the lockdown. All our drivers are paid drivers um, and early on we um, we took a commitment to sign up to the Living Wage Foundation and that accreditation was really important to us um, and it really put that stamp of, of what being a cooperative is about not not just being a cooperative but looking at how you can link with other ideas and values and organizations and this year we've won funding to be able to employ someone to carry out part-time admin tasks which is going to be a huge help to us because our volunteer capacity behind the scenes was really heavily relied on and it's really good to kind of release some of that and put that into a paid role and, and generate those job opportunities um, our income comes from bus fares um, including the bus pass rebate scheme which is passported to us via the county council um, the bus service operators grant, member share capital, and also we've had some success with um, community infrastructure levy and section 106 funding, which is something that we're pursuing quite heavily. Um, and we've also received grants through um, cooperative organisations and societies, but also the lottery and other local grant funders. Um, so the crucial thing for us, and, and going back to that question about this policy discussion in terms of what does a connected community mean from our perspective relating to buses, um, for us, it's very much about choice. So enabling people to still have that choice about how they get about in their communities, to not be isolated in their homes and to be able to have self-driven travel. So to not have to phone a taxi or to rely on a neighbor to take them somewhere, but that they can still go out of their homes and stand at a bus stop and, and get on that bus and, and communicate with people in, in that sort of context. But also we wanted to give some power back. So before our bus services were cut originally from the commercial provider, there'd actually been years of uncertainty about the viability of those routes. 
So people that relied on those services had had a really long time of feeling quite powerless from one year to the next. There were always rumours flying around about reduction of services or cancellation of services. Um, and, it, and it was really difficult emotionally for people who, who relied on those bus routes to have that constant roller coaster of, of whether that service was going to continue. So when we did set up the organisation, part of the idea was to say that the power was actually in people's hands and that we could support them to run that bus service, but that we'd be open with them about the challenges and we can't operate at a loss. We have to generate enough income from fares and, and other sources to, to operate in that way. We're not having to get the profits that the commercial providers are, but we can't just kind of continually lose money. So we really wanted to develop that that power for our local communities to say that if, if they invested in the bus and they used the bus, then then they could they could be that force in, in keeping the bus going forwards. Um, I think when we talk about cooperatives and, and what we're doing here with these new ideas, a lot of what Steve touched on is, is really relevant because we do need to ensure whenever we're talking about cooperative models that we're not being sucked into an idea of um, just doing a low cost version of something that was being delivered before because for cooperatives we do have to have that responsibility to be financially stable and it's important that we can have more flexibility because we're values driven about what we're doing in terms of profits or any profits that are generated are reinvested back into growing that service but I do think that fundamental commitment to not just say that we're there as an option to do something on the cheap that was being done or funded by a local authority is, is important. And, and to do that, I think you've got to have the strength to stand up to local authorities um, and other decision makers in the area, really, and, and, and be clear about what your objectives are and what you are realistically able to do with, with the model that you're operating. Um, some of the things that I've been thinking about around that over the, the last few years that I've been involved with this um, is definitely how we can use some of the powers that are already there. Um, things like the enhanced quality bus partnership agreements in the past. I think local authorities have used them very sparingly in their relationship with commercial bus providers. They've perhaps used them to um, roll out Wi-Fi on buses or um, introduce through ticketing. Um, but there are options to have discussions with bus providers about provision for less used routes and, um, and, and keeping that network of connectivity going. And I think that we need to have more conversations about that and really interrogate what current legislation can do to empower more services that don't have to achieve a really high financial return, um, but are about creating a connected network that isn't just about the frequently used commuter routes, because it's, it's those kind of non-commuter routes that have really, really suffered over the years as the as the bus network has been eroded. I think there needs to be a demystification of developer funding, so community infrastructure levy where it's been adopted or still section 106 money. And we need to make sure that all cooperatives that are delivering services for their communities have an understanding about how to speak to their planning authority about accessing those funds, because it's been quite productive for us. And I think there are definitely options for it to be productive for other services that have similar commitments to meeting the needs of, of our communities. Um, and I think we also have to have um, a conversation about how we can have re-regulated or municipal bus services where there isn't a mayor. So there have there have been some flexibilities introduced around that, but I think that there needs to be a wider discussion about that at Westminster level because there isn't enough of a committed network to wider areas and there is far too much focus, as I say, on those profitable commuter routes. So we need to go back to a situation where we have local authorities committed to sustaining a properly networked public transport route around buses. Um, and for me, that all comes back to the fact that we need people to almost relearn in communities how to use buses, because certainly in West Oxfordshire, um, some of our services in, in the town, um, we, we were able to take over directly from um, Stagecoach. So there was no gap in service. We just took over from that and we had that, that passenger base to, to, to build on, which we have built on. But um, in terms of our rural routes, we were developing routes there that hadn't existed before or, or 
had only ex existed in some sense quite a long time ago. So that's been much slower to build because we've had to teach people that they can rely on the option of a bus being there um, and, and teach them again how to use that to connect up with, with other routes. And I think that all across the country, there's been a loss of confidence in a sustainable bus network. So that's something that needs to be worked on because you can only really grow those services when people are ready and willing to hand themselves over to them as a viable alternative to, to using a car. Um, I also think we need to review um, the bus pass rebate scheme. I'm very committed to the idea of concessionary bus passes, but local government does need to be fully reimbursed by, um, by central government for those because there's still quite a significant shortfall and that leads to um, lots of different calculations and variabilities about how different local authorities actually use that, that rebate. So I think that's another really significant factor. But um, at the end of the day, I do think that having a cooperative model where people can have that investment in their services and have um, that opportunity to say what's working for them, what isn't working for them, what their public transport means to them is really crucial. And, and that's, that's what really running things under a cooperative model is all about. It's about that choice and that power um, from communities to drive services. Um, so I think that you know, the future is bright in lots of ways. We've got all sorts of challenges because of the erosion of passenger numbers around public transport, but we've been surprised actually um, at the level of demand that's come back quite swiftly. And again, we did do that in partnership with our members by phoning around um, while the services were on lockdown to talk to people about what their concerns were, what sorts of things would make them feel more comfortable on the bus, um, how we could accommodate that. Um, and, and I think that's really paid off, but we are still restricted. So our buses can't run at full capacity at the moment. Um, so that is having an impact. And especially after the financial commitment that we've had from our local authority ends at the end of the financial year, um, at the moment they're making up um, the shortfall. So we are being reimbursed for our passenger numbers based on, on last year. But after that, with the financial challenges that they're, they're facing as a local authority, then I think that times could become quite, quite difficult. So there does have to be a really significant think around how we address coming out of um, the pandemic and understanding how we can sustain bus um, less isolated communities and, and those, those various issues. Um, but given all that, I am still hopeful um, so, um, yeah, I'd be really interested to hear anybody's questions, but thank you, Chris, for chairing this session. It's, it's really interesting as always. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Some really interesting stuff there, um, cause connecting communities is quite a complex subject and this is such an important part of that. Um, we've overrun, this session has been appallingly chaired and we've overrun. Um, so um, there is a suggestion for Monica that um, you might want to form a partnership with the phone co-op. Um, it seemed a real way of implementing principle six. So there's a, a quick one for you there, Monica. And um, a question I think um, for you, Laura, um, how can we reduce the dominance of the big profit making bus, private bus companies and have more co-op and not for profit buses delivering routes people actually need? I think you're muted. Yeah, okay. Um, it's, it's, it, that, that's a tricky one at the moment because the permit system that a lot of community transport operators um, operate under is a section, something called a section 22 permit, which actually means that legally we're not allowed to, um, to basically go up against um, commercial providers for, for routes. So that does mean that we're, we're left with the commercially unviable routes to operate, which in some senses is fine because, you know, we are focused on the idea of delivering to communities that have been left wanting. Um, but it does make it more challenging to meet that commitment that I've just said about, you know, co-ops need to be allowed to not just be the kind of um, option that local authorities or government look to throw things to. We, we've got to be allowed to be a vibrant business in ourselves. Um, so 
I think that first of all, there would need to be some kind of financial assistance or help to allow us to operate on, to allow a co-op service to operate on what we call an operator's license, which would put us on the, the same level as the commercial operators. Um, and, and then we would be in a position to be able to kind of tender um, for, with, the, with the Department of Transport to run some of those commercial routes. But there, but at the moment, we wouldn't want to do anything to jeopardise our Section 22 permit, which is the best way for us to operate the services that we're interested in. Um, but as I was saying, I think there definitely needs to be a bit more interrogation of what the existing legislation can allow us to do. So, um, so definitely looking at, at what scope there is in things like um, bus partnership agreements where local authorities can negotiate with commercial providers that, you know, if they're putting in bus lanes or they're building a big park and ride that's going to benefit a commercial route, then what could potentially those commercial providers do to perhaps even support community transport? Um, in, in their area. We happen to have locally a good relationship with Stagecoach Oxfordshire, um, just in terms of, of working with their local representatives. But I think we all recognise that there is that, there is that tension between people operating on Section 22s and commercial operators. So I, I suppose my, 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 my ideas are that, first of all, we need to kind of stretch more what the existing legislation allows us to do to its limits and then find out where its limits are and potentially what we might need to change and and for me i think local areas should be allowed to set up their own bus companies that can operate routes without having to have a mayor in place because it's quite restrictive at the moment and areas haven't really run with it even though the, the powers theoretically are there i'd still like to have a west midlands mayor though <laughs> right <laughs> Um, just yes, send me for that question. Sorry, Monica. Sorry, I was just going to say, do, shall I answer my question now? Are we going to carry on? No. no. If you want to answer that question, that'd be good. Yeah, it was just to say that, yes, um, we, we would be looking for um, working with other people and other groups wherever we can. Um, just at present, we're running around desperately digging holes. <laughs> but, uh, we, we do have on the longer term plan um, some sort of VoIP provision and uh, working with other companies just to answer that. Thank you, Monica. Um, do you want me to chip in, Chris? Well, I've got, I've got a question for you, Steve. Excellent. OK, I shall hang on. Um, and it's from, it's from Charlie. Platform co-ops are an important aspect of this agenda. Is there any helpful guidance or case studies about how they can use existing social media platforms to build support and then migrate people to their own platform. You mentioned platform co-op, so you know you asked for this. <laughs> yes, that, that might that might be a level of technical expertise that's that, that, that's beyond me. But but let me just um, talk about what I think the opportunity is here, because um, you've got uh, local authorities in their areas provide services for communities but a lot of the cooperative councils in the co-op councils network are looking at how you can co-produce services with people instead of just doing things to them and it, it, it generates a number of benefits compared to a traditional way of doing services first of all it tends to deliver better value for money because people who are using or delivering a service on the front line see what is inefficient and what is efficient what is effective and what is not effective and if the service decision making process is uh, responsive to them then they can cause the service to improve by that mechanism but but a second point that's very very important is if you give people particularly people whose experience uh, of life is being very marginalized being socially excluded they don't they, they tend to experience a lot of life as things done to them rather than having control over their own life and if you co-produce a, a decision with them so they help to determine the outcome they wish to achieve the intervention or the service that will help to deliver it and how it's delivered, they suddenly start to get back a sense of control over their own life that can really boost their sense of well-being, um, their sense of self-respect, their sense of control over their own life. All of these things are immensely important, particularly to people who experience uh, 
life as things that is done to them and it, you know it can really really knock the stuffing out of people doing that so we want more co-produced services we want communities to participate more we want communities to have both a voice and the power to assert it then that may well lead you to more community-owned and community-led services we've been hearing about you know bus buses for instance broadband is another but it could be pretty much anything uh, that councils do so how do you find a mechanism that allows a number of smaller scale uh, providers in the public sector, but it's sort of publicly owned, but in a different way to participate without becoming so uneconomic because they've all got to generate their own HR system, their own finance system, their own IT system. You know, it's called an, a, 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 an economy of scale you're looking for. Well, the, the obvious way to me is why not use the, the state owned back office that we already have in every area through local authorities and open that up to community um, owned services, community led services, supporting communities to participate in decision making on their own terms, you create an economy of scale across a whole range of community led services. That means a future Conservative government uh, could not just come in uh, and enforce some kind of compulsory competitive tendering that means the capitas and the IT nets knock all of these community-led services out of the way. For me, that is a model of um, platform cooperativism, but applied to local authority, government and governance. And I, I think it would be, and it is an incredibly radical uh, and different model, but I think, it, you know, allied to a system of devolution of power from the centre uh, and localization. This becomes a key plank of then directly empowering citizens to take more control. And uh, you know, this is a conversation we'll be having over the next few years as we start to talk about what does what would the next Labour government look like if we're serious about opening up power and participation to everybody, but above all, the most marginalised and vulnerable, so that they can take back more control over their own lives. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Um, I think what I, I, I'd like to do now is, um, first of all, to, to thank our panellists for making, I think, um, a tremendous contribution to the proceedings here today. It's been absolutely brilliant. Um, but I think it's now the point at which um, we, we need to throw it open to the members to hear their ideas, their proposals, experiences and reflections uh, on topics of buses, broadband and connectivity. The policy paper for this topic is, is on the resources section of the Co-op Party's website. Um, if you do want to take part in the debate, you need to come and join us on Zoom rather than watching on our website, although you can still comment through the Q&A box. Um, can I ask speakers that I call to keep their contributions to around three minutes so I can include everybody who wishes to speak? So when I call you, can you please make sure both your video and your sound are on so that we can see and hear you? Although please know that we are recording this session as we do with all our Zoom events and all of our conference sessions so people can catch up after the event. So with that, um, can I call, first of all, um, Christina Rees, please? Hello. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, hi. Um, I'm Christine Rees. I'm the uh, Labour and Cooperative MP for Neath. And I've been asked to say a little bit about what's going on in Wales and Neath. So I'll set the scene with a pioneering community development work in Neath during the miners' strike. Neath constituency is made up of three valleys, the Amman, the Dillice and the Neath Valley. In 1984, my Francis set up a women's cooperative called the Dev Workshop in Onshine at the top of the Delice Valley to retrain women to work and support the families whose men were on strike. This grew out of the local minor support group led by Meyer's husband, Howell. And I'm sure many of you know Howell. He went on to become the MP for Aberavon and retired in 2015. Glynneath Training Centre and Amman Valley Enterprise followed soon afterwards in the other two valleys of Neath. These organisations were a response to adversity and a means by which communities have connected and continue to do so. The Dillers Valley Partnership was set up in the 90s following collaborative models of working which were developing across Europe so the communities, public sector and voluntary organisation worked together to deliver projects and regeneration. Howell was a driving force again, 
and this partnership extended this connected community cooperative ethos to other parts of my constituency, such as Estelavera and Malin. The partnership created the Dillice Valley Community Transport Scheme, DANSA, which was set up in 1999 by Councillor Ali Thomas, former leader of Neath Patalba Council. By 2009, this project has grown into a social enterprise with 26 staff, 20 vehicles, and now operates across Neath and Swansea, filling in the gaps left by mainstream public transport and diversified to deliver food parcels during the pandemic. We are proud of the Wales Cooperative Centre, a not-for-profit cooperative organisation set up by the Wales TUC in 1982 to support people in Wales to improve their lives and their livelihoods and promote growth of cooperatives and social enterprises in Welsh communities. And huge congratulations to the Wales Cooperative Centre's Digital Communities Wales project, which has reached the final three of the Digital Leaders 100 wards for its tablet loan scheme delivered during the COVID-19 crisis. We held our uh, Wales Cooperative Conference in June virtually. It was a great success with Mark Drakeford as our keynote speaker. So some would say we led the way for this conference in Wales and we tested out the virtual platform. I was first elected in 2015 and have spent the last five years in opposition. I envy our cooperative cooperators in the Welsh Labour government who have had the power to implement their cooperative vision. Now the Welsh Labour government set up the Development Bank for Wales, which provides a wide range of services for established businesses to fill gaps in the market and has been vital in supporting businesses during this pandemic. Mark has pledged to introduce community banking with branches providing funds for local businesses and to recycle local savings into local loans. Now Thatcher once said that anyone over the age of 26 using a bus should consider themselves a failure, so I'm an absolute failure. The Welsh Government created Transport for Wales, a not-for-profit organisation for public transport in Wales to deliver an integrated transport network buses, trains and act active travel, and to turn railway stations into vibrant community hubs with small businesses providing essential services. The South Wales Metro is underway, and in time this will be extended to North Wales and Swansea Bay. Neath Labour Party held a Zoom event last month with my friend Alex Norris MP speaking about his private members bill. It provides greater protection for retail workers and tougher sentences for their abusers. He was supported on the call by our wonderful Deputy General Secretary, Karen Wilkie, and Nick Island, Wales and West Political Officer for ESDO. This is an example of the Cooperative Party and trade unions working together. I must also mention the very excited prospect of the Global Centre of Rail Excellence in Wales being located in my Neath constituency. The Welsh Government is working with Neath for Talbot and Powys County Council to cite this amazing project on the Nantelling surface mine and onshoring washery sites at the head of the Delice Valley. This proposal, which is set out to final consultation in the community, will provide a rail testing facility, research and development, an education training center, and storage and maintenance facilities, and provide much needed jobs and infrastructure to our valleys decimated by Thatcher and pave the way to reopen the valley passenger railway lines closed by Beeching and bring tourism to our beautiful valleys. I've written to the UK government many times, urging them to support this Welsh government project, but the response, as you can imagine, is less than encouraging. The Welsh government aims to put digital inclusion at the forefront, ensuring all Welsh citizens are connected and engaged. The Welsh government will build on the success of Supervast Cymru and launch a new program to co coordinate con connectivity and 5G projects. To every social democratic socialist, economy geared to meet the needs of the many is the foundation of a good society. There has always been a partnership approach in Wales. Our workplace is our greatest economic asset, so we invest in people. Proper worker participation and representation through recognised trade unions and collective bargaining. 
better jobs closer to home in partnership with the Wales TUC and a fair commission, a fair world commission to manage the social and economic challenges of the 21st century. So these are all very exciting projects that show in Wales, we are determined to stamp out the in work poverty legacy of the last 10 years of Tory UK government. So I hope that's just a flavour of what's going on. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Christina. And it also shows the importance of Labour being in government. It really does matter, doesn't it? It does. Yeah, it does. Can I, can I call on um, Adrian Sharrett now? And before I do, can I just say that if we need to overrun slightly, can I ask for the forbearance of co-op party staff? Because I'd like to get as many in as we can. So Adrian Sharrett, please. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, my question is a more general question because this is about connecting communities and rebuilding communities. Since Thatcher's days, when she said there's no such thing as communities, we've seen an atomization of society. If you talk to car drivers, for instance, they would say it's much better getting in a car to go to work rather than getting a bus and walking. And because of that, it takes longer to get from A to B. Whereas if we'd have proper public transport, we would uh, we would find the times be shortened. So people see things, everything in a very marginal, personal sense. And that is a ratchet that has been built by the right, by the Tory government over the years. We're seeing this now with health, whether they're, they're uh, um, reducing the funding going into their uh, into health um, provision. So people are now turning to private. Uh, even more so than they were before. So I see this in particular with local communities when I'm a cyclist and if I go along and I have people who shout at me to get off the road onto a pavement because th that was built uh, with public money and yet it has stops every driveway and is no use as a commuter. So what policies do, well, it's the final point was that community centres have been uh, privatised or, or communitized, but they struggle, they can't survive properly and they don't provide the same provision and it's done on the cheap. So we have a real problem with uh, the atomization of society. What policies do the panel feel they should adopt on an overarching uh, approach uh, to try and uh, reverse this trend and to rebuild communities as a social organisation where we can move forward together. And the sort of things that, uh, is it Steve Reed was saying, where people as individuals can participate rather than uh, just being a minority or being over, over um, um, shouted over by other groups we have a real policy which will take us forward, notwithstanding these, these difficulties. Well, thank you, Adrian. I think under pressure of time, we may not have time for the panel to respond today, but I'm sure they've made a note of that, um, that question. Um, the next speaker I have is, is Chris Vince. Thank you, uh, Chris. Um, my name is uh, Chris Vince and I'm the new representative on the NEC for the East of England um, and along with Chris, other Chris I'm also on the policy uh, subcommittee as well. Um, I welcome all members to conference but I particularly want to welcome those from the East many of whom I've already met but many more I look forward to meeting albeit virtually in coming months to discuss the future of our party and indeed the future of the cooperative movement. It would be remiss of me not to mention the wonderful Chris Harris and to say that if I can be, I was going to say one half, but actually if I can be one tenth the cooperator and the NEC member that Chris was, I'd be doing a good job. It's ironic that I've actually asked to speak on a policy topic which includes broadband as part of it. Uh, and the reason um, I'm really delighted that Chris and Mary have, uh, have volunteered to chair this policy debate for me, uh, well, for, for the group, because um, as all my uh, fellow members of the NEC know, uh, my, my internet has been particularly unreliable over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think people in the NEC were wondering whether I'd gone quiet or whether I'd frozen. Um, but when our sister party last year uh, spoke at the general election um, about 
the importance of um, free broadband for all. Uh, many people uh, mock the idea, but we've seen this year how vital the ability to use the internet, to use social media and other online platforms has been. For many, it has been a real lifeline uh, and one that I don't think can be underestimated. And it's particularly poignant um, considering the fact that it was Mental Health Awareness Day yesterday. Outside uh, of the CARP party, I am a councillor in Harlow and in May, I was made the portfolio holder for community and wellbeing. And I was really looking forward to, as part of that role, um, supporting local events, even organising some myself. Yet sadly, since I took on that role, all I seem to be doing is cancelling events because of this terrible pandemic. And again, the internet has been vital, making sure important community events like Pride and Black History Month can still go ahead, again, albeit virtually. I believe this word community is so vital and anyone who has ever had the misfortune of listening to me speak before will know it's a word I use again and again. For me, cooperatives and the cooperative party have a key role to play in our community. I believe we could, we should, and in places like West Oxfordshire, we already do, have a huge part to play in our bus networks. Bus networks that don't uh, recognise the importance of some routes that aren't considered profitable and Laura made some really important points about these rural routes that again are absolute lifelines for communities but these private companies aren't interested in touching I think that's something that you know we have a role to play in but also we have a role to play in our digital connectivity and how we respond to the climate crisis and I'm glad that all of these things are mentioned in our policy document. I don't want to say any more because primarily I want to listen to you to get your ideas and your views. To those members in the East, this will be my prim primary aim as your representative. I look forward to cooperating with you moving forward and thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak at this year's conference. Thank you, Chris. And none of us thought you'd gone quiet, by the way. I, I, you, you, yeah, you know me too well already, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I have uh, Thomas Johnson now, please? Yes, I just wanted to say that I support the uh, policy documents. Uh, our bus services are vital. A green revolution needs reliable public transport that uh, uses new technology to reduce emissions. Uh, without uh, buses, we're not going to be able to deliver that. Uh, the large companies are putting their profits before the people, not recognising people from of our areas. Uh, we have a thriving local business park near ourselves uh, that uh, has bus services running at about 5.05 in the afternoon when people are finished at five o'clock. By the time they get to leave, they've missed the bus and the next one isn't for about another hour. That surely isn't acceptable with the fact that we're moving to more flexible shifts. We need a bus service that's uh, round the clock offer more things? Do we want to see people like our NHS staff and uh, volunteers after a long night shift actually having to sit and wait for a bus for 30, 40 minutes because there's none available early in the morning? It's unacceptable. So I support a cooperative solution, putting people before profit, more choice and a solution that makes sense. Thanks very much, Chair. Excellent, Thomas, thank you for that. Uh, and I applaud every word of it. Um, can I have uh, Pauline Bacon now, please? Hello. Oh, it's not my video. We, we can hear you, we just can't see you. That's all right, I'm coming. Um, <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, I'm Pauline Bacon. I'm delegate for North East Essex. And following on from something that was said yesterday, um, I've got a, um, a sister-in-law who lives in a, a rural community in Essex and the reason why she said to me that um, she couldn't meet me is because I could be standing there for a bus and because of Covid restrictions if it's too full they'll just drive by me. So I'm wondering obviously there was something said yesterday uh, from a fellow cooperator about um, community taxis 
And uh, I just wondered whether we there's any way of, of, of starting up community taxi companies which are door to door for particularly disabled people, people going to appointments, who in a lot of cases, they can go to an appointment on patient transport, but if they want to have someone go with them, they're not allowed to have someone go with them. Um, and also a lot of people, you know, with patient transport, um, you, you end up going round and round and you can be out for like six hours or whatever for what is largely like a, a half hour appointment. So the, the sort of things where we could have a um, community taxi company and then maybe tra people transfer their bus passes to taxi vouchers. Now, I know it happens in Suffolk um, where you can trade in your um, bus pass for a, a taxi voucher, so only about £100 worth of taxi vouchers. Now, if you've got two pensioners living together between them, that's like £200 of taxi vouchers. And it can make a huge difference to them because buses don't always go exactly where they want to go, but they still need to get there. And as people get older, they lose their licenses for a variety of reasons or it's just not economic for them to have a car anymore. Um, and but they still need to get places. So I'm just wondering what the policy is around that, whether we, anything can be done along that. Thank you. Important contribution, Pauline. Thank you for that. Um, Sandy Martin, please. Right, you can hear me now. Um, hi, Chris. Yes, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, it was um, actually many years ago uh, when I travelled on the uh, drivers' cooperative owned bus company buses in Israel. Um, we're going back to the 70s here. And actually, that was one of the things that led me to join the cooperative party in the first place, because I could see that this was a company that was run by the people who were actually working in it, uh, who understood the issues and the problems, who had a vested interest in making the buses run as effectively as they possibly could, and who were rewarded when their buses did well. Um, and so I, I think really, I, mean, I was so pleased to hear what Steve had to say. Um, I've had long conversations with uh, Matt Rodder, who is our um, shadow uh, minister for buses uh, in the past, because Ipswich has a municipal bus company, and so indeed does Reading, where Matt lives. But um, I'm, I really think we need to look at how we can involve the workforce in any cooperatives as well as the users. Um, and I think there are tax and um, other legal uh, issues that stand in the way of workforce being involved in cooperatives in this country, which is deeply unhelpful. It's one of the things I really like the cooperative party to work on the changes that we need to make to the tax regime and to other legal frameworks in order to make sure that we can involve the workforce in cooperatives in the future uh, in this country, because it works really well in some other countries. Uh, but whenever anyone has tried to involve the workforce in cooperatives in this country, they've come up against hurdles, which I'm sure were put there deliberately. Um, so that's the that's the message I've got. And it's a message for Steve and also for Jim McMahon as well. But I'm sure that Steve and Jim McMahon meet each other on a regular basis on this sort of issue. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Sandy. Um, yeah, the ability of co-ops to work at the scale and pace necessary is really important. And we have to find a way of making that happen. Excellent contribution. Thank you, Sandy. Um, Michael Whitaker, please. Uh, good afternoon, delegates. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak this afternoon and uh, really encouraged by the policy paper on uh, buses and broadband today. And in developing the theme of the policy paper set out on supporting vulnerable people and communities and delivering food and other forms of deliveries, I'd like to sort of just extend potentially the work of that to extend that to form of a form of some form of public service obligation for access for passengers to goods and services and to consider the great role that community transport can play in terms of developing the movement of lightweight uh, uh, parcels and other activities alongside community transport to potentially provide another form of revenue stream, particularly to rural areas, and working with communities through the use of community space, maybe for, 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 the, for the last mile to um, uh, people's houses and small businesses that have activities in that. So they have equivalent access, a bit like the physical internet of the work that Monica very, very eloquently set out. Um, we could be working uh, with that. So we have a number of 
public sector organisations that operate in rural areas. And I think the use of that capacity and space could be very worthwhile to work with uh, both physical uh, internet through rural areas through throughout the United Kingdom. And I just propose that to uh, for that to be considered as part of the great work that you're doing. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. That was uh, that was a really good contribution. Can I can I have Jenny Smith now, please? Is Jenny Smith there? It work. Ah. Oh, sorry, it wasn't working. Um, I think it's absolutely essential that we look at transport. We not only want it environmentally clean, we want it regular. We want it going where people actually need to go for employment, for anything else that they're involved with. And um, remote areas of this country have nothing. And it's about time we address that. I'm elderly. I thought they'd taken my um, driving license away and I managed to get it back. But I'm not the only one. Uh, many elderly people, when you reach a certain age, find that your health is affecting your driving license. Uh, I'm, I think I've gone off soon. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> We can still see and hear you. Oh, good. So I'm talking to a blank screen, but I don't mind. I, also, the disabled, the people with disabilities, how are they getting around? They can't live in a certain areas of the country. And yet, therapeutically, it might be good for, for some of their conditions, like mental illness or physical difficulties. We've got to look at uh, public transport. It's essential. And it's got to be cheap enough for people to afford. The, the city I live in, Bristol, is talking about possibly making public transport free. I think it's the answer. We have lots of areas surrounding us that are coming in, driving in, a, a parking up on our streets, and then people working in the city. That's got to be addressed. It's not good for them. It's not good for the city dwellers. And it's certainly not good for the environment that we live in. Thank you, Jenny. That's a helpful contribution. Thank you for that. I'm afraid we're actually running out of time now, so I can only really manage a couple more. Can I have um, Valerie bosman Quashi next, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chris, um, Chair, and everybody. Um, I just want to just add my own personal experience. Um, I, I really think that we must empower our communities. And the lady just mentioned um, about people with disabilities and the elderly. Uh, my nan lives in Croydon, so it was nice to hear a, a Croydon MP speak. And I think it's really important that when we're looking at transport and even Wi-Fi access, that we look at these, these two groups in particular. Um, connectivity on the buses is really important because you can think sometimes when you're in a, you know, a busy household, you don't have that quiet time. Think of how, you know, when, young people are traveling on the buses and they need um, connectivity on the buses. And in some parts of the UK, we actually have that. So it should be spread across the whole of the UK. I'm just thinking also about the, obviously the pandemic and when lockdown happened um, here in Islington, it was really great to see um, a hub come to life where a lot of the community came together and were doing food deliveries. They were using their cars to help um, to deliver to people that were most vulnerable in our local areas. Um, but I still think it didn't go far enough. And we now have the people um, friendly streets in Islington, which is really great. And I think the lady mentioned um, about having like uh, cab services, obviously with the, the right um, eco um, filters, etc. But I think if we had that, it would actually enable people to actually get to see each other a bit more. We saw in, on TV during the pandemic, you know, some people coming out in their out of their estates or out of their roads and having sort of like community kind of parties, but 
obviously social distancing, but we need to think about innovative ways of how we come together. So if we can't use our, our hubs um, for safe space and we can use our local streets, obviously self social distancing. But I think if we push forward with these sort of innovative ideas, then people can actually come together and speak more and be together. Because at the moment we have people that are really feeling lonely and isolated. And I think if we don't look at things in a more open kind of you know, broader sense, then more people will be left behind and we know what it's like when you feel vulnerable and left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Valerie. Obviously from the heart, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna get time, unfortunately, for one more speaker. So if you don't get on, I do apologize. Um, if you wanna put your comments in the Q&A um, section on the website, we will pick them up. Um, but I'll have, uh, I'll have Rob Watson now, and then I'll ask my colleague Mary to, to sum up um, at the end. So Rob Watson, please. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the things with the paper is, it, I mean, it's, everything is, is absolutely laudable, but there's a kind of a missing dimension, which is our media, uh, which is the idea that we, we have 300 community radio stations in the UK, and they're ignored in all policy discussions and developments. Uh, we have a rush sometimes to go towards di putting everything, making everything digital, but we forget some of the established broadcast mechanisms, local newspapers. Here, here in Leicester through the pandemic, it's been a real challenge for some of the established community media groups, the radio stations, and then the addition of the mutual aid support groups to really come together to kind of present information which is trusted and accountable. And I, I use the definition of community media for me is is trust based and accountability based so community radio stations are regulated by ofcom but there is no i can i honestly i've got a phd in community media i do not know of any recent policy organization that has said it wants to look at community media for all of the reasons that have been given today the infrastructure the skills the connectivity the the identity in local communities it's doesn't exist and we've got in the policy paper during lockdown geographically and socially isolated communities have been able to access things more we, we, we and it says you know we need to keep that going yes we do this is all of a sudden this is zoom has become a form of community media you know it's going to be published on youtube so we need to go for this in a much more ambitious kind of joined up kind of way because we're missing something and if people aren't engaged and allowed to represent themselves through their media, own their own media, be their own media, then the corporate takeover will just carry on. The bungs that will that come from the government to their friends in corporate media will carry on and everybody will feel increasingly isolated and separated from civic discussion and debate. So I think we've got to add that extra dimension to it because without it, we can't uh, move forward. Such an interesting point, Rob. Thank you. We, we do need to take that into account. I hadn't even thought of it. Thank you for that. So um, it's been an excellent debate. Can I, can I ask you, Mary, if you could just uh, sum up and, and give us your thoughts about, about what you've heard? Thanks, thanks very much, Chris. Um, and normally at this stage, I'd be worried that I was standing between everybody and their lunch. But given that it's virtual, I suspect many of you are already started eating your lunch. So the only person whose lunch I'm standing between is mine. Um, but I will um, just give a bit of an overview. And I think it's very clear we picked, um, or last year's NEC picked some really pertinent topics here that have turned out to be even more pertinent than they realised. Um, and we've had a focus on the inequalities of power. I think some of the themes raised by our speakers have run all the way through the debate. The fact that we are, as humans, social and cooperative beings, the particular needs of people in rural areas or people who have constraints on accessibility of many you know, usual forms of even conferences, but also other forms of activity that we all take part in. And that what has grown out of the pandemic has been a real opportunity to bring people together and to already start 
building things that are better. I was obviously delighted to hear from um, Chris and get a get a report from from Wales. Um, but also, you know, we aren't in government in the UK, but we are in Wales and we have local councils. Chris Vince gave us an example of what he's able to do there. We have mayors, hopefully more of them soon, and we have police and crime commissioner elections coming up next year. <coughs> There's been a big focus in this debate on transport and broadband because I think they're issues that people know we've got problems that we need to solve. And I think that's where we as cooperators can make the biggest difference difference is actually looking at problems on the ground and providing solutions to them. I thought that was a really interesting um, contribution at the end as well about the media. Um, and one of the things I was going to say as I finished um, is that we need to set a policy agenda for what the policy committee is doing and involving you as members with in terms of discussions over the next year. And so I think we'll certainly feed in those themes from that debate. But if you do have other thoughts about things that you really think it's worth us kind of taking up, promoting, engaging with and developing policy on, then please do let us know. Um, We've obviously looked at one paper earlier this morning and then another paper in this session. And I'd like to thank everybody so much who contributed. That's both today in terms of the speakers on the panel, but also in terms of um, contributions um, from the audience as well. But also the people who spent the time to make submissions either through local party branches or individually that have influenced those policy papers. Normally at the conference, we take a vote on those papers now, but because it's virtual, we can't wave our hands in the air to the, in the way that we, we normally would. So as was explained after the first policy debate earlier today, we'll be taking all the votes, including on the policy papers at the AGM, which is next Saturday morning. So thank you so much for taking part. We really appreciate that. Um, we look forward to seeing you at the AGM, of course, but also at the sessions going on throughout the week. So we've got an afternoon session at three o'clock today and we've got some sessions on campaigning. And then throughout the week, we've got a single lunchtime an evening session. So you really have the opportunity to get involved, contribute, hear more about what local cooperators are doing on the ground and think about how we all build that in our local communities. Thank you very much for taking part. Thank you. I echo everything you said, Mary. Um, and um, conference now stands down till three o'clock. Thank you. <laughs>